love. And that's what it says. God is love. Amen. Not just that he has love over you, but he is love. He's all about love. And he's never going to be anything else but love over you. And But when I first came to him, I just couldn't believe that he would love me without anything. When I was so love, loveless, that I, when I was so far out there that he would love me. And just let that sink in this morning. Just let that uh, just shower over you. I took my mom to Dallas yesterday and we went to a homeless camp. And you know what? There's one person there that, that I've been ministering to and, and, and we just, oh man. This guy, his name is David and he's got a heart for God. He's got issues, a lot of issues, but he's had his head bashed in and he's lost an eye and he's got, he's got uh, this part of his, it's, it's been, he died twice during that and he's still alive and he knows he's alive for a reason. He knows he is and um, he's had cancer, colon cancer, you know, and we prayed over that too and I believe in a miracle and I believe in, he's caught a calling to preach on his life. And uh, I'm telling you, David's set free this morning. I know he is because we prayed yesterday all the bonds to be loosened. And God's love, every time I sing something about God, I just I just have him in mind and my brother Larry in mind. You know what? They are set free. I'm declaring that this morning. If you have any bondages, shake them off this morning. Shake them off. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, amen. Give the Lord a hand. Y'all can be seated for a moment. Praise the Lord. Uh, we want to uh, lift up Brother Paul this morning. He's not he's not feeling good. We're thinking he may have a uh, maybe have a hernia. And so we need to lift him up this morning and, and, and pray for him so so I don't forget. Let's just go ahead and do that and then we'll proceed on with the service. And so Father, we lift up Paul this morning. Lord bless our brother. I pray healing in his body. I pray in the name of Jesus that, that every, not, not just every symptom, but that every symptom would be gone, but that the root cause would be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll lift up our brother Donovan here this morning and call him whole in the name of Christ Jesus. And we thank you for it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Matter of fact, just if, if you need healing this morning, just let's just agree. Father, for each and every one this morning needs a physical healing. By the authority of the name of Christ, we call you, call each other whole. Whether it's heart disease, diabetes, cancer, any of these things, Father, in the name of Christ Jesus, we call them whole. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Man, I'm telling you, God is so good. Isn't he? Isn't he wonderful? Amen. Good to see Sharon back in here with us. She she tried to dive in the shallow end of the yard. I didn't try. I did. Oh, she successfully made a dive into a rock on the shallow end of her yard, or her neighbor's yard. But she's okay. She's a little banged up, but she's going to be fine. Amen. I started to tell you she's a tough old bird, but I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> we're not so tough in this house. Yes, amen. 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 And amen. All right. Let's receive our, our Sunday morning offering. Praise the Lord. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you giving. Good to see Mike Jackson in here with us this morning. And you know, he needs, he just, He's, he's had a battle physically for a good while. And, uh, and, and he's going to have to have some more tests and stuff done. So y'all just stretch your hands to our brother Mike back there. And let's just, let's just lift him up to today, specifically. Father, I speak life into him in the name of Jesus. I speak wholeness into him in the name of Jesus. Lord, I declare your word over him that says, with his stripes we are healed, have been healed. In Christ's name, Lord, your word says if any two or three agree is touching anything, it'll be done. And how can two walk together unless they be agreed? So we agree together with one another today. Yes, and more importantly, Lord, we agree with your word and with your will over his physical body.
body. And we, by the authority of that name of Jesus, we call him whole and healed today. Thank you for doctors as we always pray. Guide their hands, Father God. Use them for your glory, but you're the great physician. So, Father, I call our brother healed and whole today in Jesus' name. And Lord, bless this offering as we receive it this morning. Father God, thank you that, that, that we're here. Thank you, Lord, that the lights are on and the air is running and that we are gathered in your name and freedom today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, let's, if you would, let's just worship the Lord a little more today. Amen. A little, a little something special here this morning. We're one nation under God. Yes. Amen. God I don't care what's been going on in the past. We're still one nation under God. Amen. Oh, 
against the spirit of depression and anxiety, please. Yes. That has just been overwhelming me this week. Yes. Not just me, but... I understand. Let's just agree together. Father, we come against any depression in any of, of us, our family members. We take authority over it, Father God, and I say that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. So let us take strength in that joy. And Father, for those that, it's easy for me to sit here and say this, I think, but it's just, oh, but what, but what? And the anxiety and, and, and the depression, Father, we, we break that right now in Jesus' name. We take authority over that right now in Jesus' name. And in it, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. We, uh, uh, children's church, for this was a children's church, yeah. So Miss Regina can kind of do that. Uh, man. Happy Fourth of July. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, us preachers are supposed to have themes and stuff and when it's the 4th of July you're supposed to have a big 4th of July independence message and we know that typically I'll get a Mother's Day message around New Year's yeah. my Christmas message many times is the 4th of July so I'm sorry it just is what it is but but man our independence was bought and paid for amen that's right that's it. Centuries That's and it. centuries ago. Yes, amen. On that old rugged cross. Amen. And by way of the cross, actually, but through an empty tomb. Amen. Aren't you glad that the tomb is empty today? Amen. And that solidified our liberty. Amen. 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 And as I, I was thinking this week about, about you know, pondering on just what it costs for us to be in this geographical place. A mixture of races in this geographical place in this year and have the freedom to gather in the name of Christ and worship him. Yes. Let me just tell you something. Yeah. It, it costs Jesus everything, yes. obviously. But it cost a lot of men and women through the centuries, yes. through the last couple of centuries in, in, in our nation. It cost them an awful lot. Hi, Candace, how are you, darling? Good to see her. Amen. Just noticed you were sitting there. Uh, it, it costs them. Amen. And before I get to go on, I just want to uh, let everybody know that, and I appreciate all of you that has come out and the way we're doing things differently on Wednesdays. That's the what I forgot to announce all of but, but this Wednesday night, y'all need to listen carefully. I know I change it up on you frequently, but this Wednesday at 6.30 sharp, here's what I would like to do. We've been going out to the Red Light Over Commerce Square. We're, we're going to do that, but at 6.30 sharp this Wednesday, I want to meet right here in the building. And, and let's worship. A lot of people can't go out and get the parking lot. It's hot. That, and that is, at this time of year, that's really a hot part of the time of the day. So we're going to meet here at 630 for about 20 or 30 minutes. We're going to 
worship, and then we're going to disperse. I say let's have a treasure hunt. Uh, we're going to go, most of us will probably go right on over to Commerce Square with our signs, and we'll be parking lot prayer. I want to tell you something. God has been moving yes, he has. Amen. Through, the, through the prayer in the parking lot. God has been moving through that drive through prayer. It's been incredible, man. And so we're still going to do that. But, but also, I'd like to do a treasure hunt because some of you, know, what's a treasure hunt? A treasure hunt is where we're going to get together and pray. Some of us absolutely, yes, are going to be at the red light. But, but I'm going to ask you to hear from God. Guess what? You can hear from God as good or better the preacher can. That was a weak amen. amen. Let me just try it again. You guys can hear from God just good if not better than I can. There you go. So as we do that, some of y'all may go, well, I felt really impressed to go to Coggin Park, or I felt really impressed to go visit. I, I appreciate what, what, Pats, what, what Patsy and Sharon have been, you know, different yes. times ago. We feel like we're supposed to go visit so-and-so. And as a matter of fact, I, I, That's needed. I, was, uh, I saw somebody the other day that, that y'all went and visited. Well, it was a chat. It's no big secret. And, and they were so appreciative. The fact that you guys came by. There. So some of you may go, well, I feel like I'm supposed to do this, that, the other. I never will forget, and I'm, I'm sidetracking this morning. Be patient with me. I'm not all coffee done. I only had one cup. Okay. This I can't pour it. One cup of one. <laughs> one cup of but one. I just drank out of one cup. I never will forget uh, about oh, 12, 15 years ago, we were, we were going to go on a treasure hunt one day, and we got right here and we prayed, and there were some teenagers with us, and there was one teenage boy that was with us, and he's like, what? I'm like, you pray, you see what the Lord shows you, right. and, and, and then we'll, we're going to go, at that time, we were going to load up go to Cocker Park and see what happens. And so after we prayed a minute, I'm asking different ones, what do you feel? What do you feel? And this, this is about a 14-year-old kid at the time. He's real skittish. He said, oh, I don't know. It's stupid. I said, no, it's not what? He said, well, while I was praying, I just saw, and I can't remember. I may not have the colors right, what I'm about to say, but give me a little license here because I don't remember. But I think he said, I saw, man, I just felt like I saw a green van and a guy in a red shirt. Or maybe it was the opposite, green shirt, red van. I don't know. I'm like, okay, well, we'll just, we'll keep our eyes open. We loaded up in Mount Pickup. We went to Cocker Park. We pulled up. As we were unloading, our green van pulled up right next to us. And a big old dude in whatever color shirt it was got out. That boy came to me and he said, that's what I saw. <laughs> so we went and we prayed for that person and we talked to him, ministered to him. And you know, it wasn't like that person just fell down on their knees right. and came to Jesus that right. day or something just fantastically supernatural happened. But you know who that was for that day? That was for that boy to go, wow, right. I can't hear from God. That's right. That's right. So, yeah. so, yeah. so this Wednesday, we're going to meet right here. Now listen, and I stress, we're going to meet right here at 6.30 sharp because we don't have a lot of time to waste or goof around. Right. We're going to worship a little bit. And then we're going to disperse and we're going to go out and, and we're still going to do the sign that maybe they'll give us about 30 minutes. So we'll be there by 7 rather than 6.30. And we'll go from 7 to about 7.30, maybe 7 to 8. I don't know. Over there. And hopefully it's not extremely hot and uncomfortable. But even if it is, we'll do it. Yeah. That's right. And so, uh, but God has been moving yeah. as we're praying for people. And, and we're praying yes. for people and meeting people that would have never come in this building. Yeah, that's right. And God has been moving. Every week, every yeah. Wednesday, yeah. Donna will have a story about something that happened, yeah. somebody that they prayed yeah. for. Yeah. And, and, and even this past Wednesday. Uh, Donna, just tell, tell what happened. Just, just Well, me and Melanie both, uh, there was a girl, a young lady that pulled up. Here, take the mic because those behind you can't hear you. Here you go. Either way, whatever. There was a young woman that pulled up and... Um, and Melanie saw her, and, and Melanie felt like she was supposed to go over there. She was there. sitting in her car. Yeah, she was sitting in the car, and, and Melanie felt like she was supposed to go over there, but she didn't. She thought, you know what? I don't want to freak anybody out or scare anybody. Right. Scare anybody here. <laughs> Not that she could scare. I could do that. <laughs> She's scared, right? Yeah. But anyway. Um, <laughs> 
but um, she didn't go. And anyway, so that girl gets out and comes. And so by that time, I'm going to her, and she just fell into my arms. And me and Melanie was able to pray with her. And to uh, she was a young mama. Uh, she had a baby two months ago. And uh, she has some depression going on. And, and, um, and it doesn't matter who she is. Um, if she's watching this, we're still praying for you. And, um, you know, she... We were able to pray with her and give her a word, and Melanie ministered to her, and I ministered to her, and and she she felt she said, you know what, I I, I just so needed this. She just got off work, and she really didn't know if she was going to continue to be able to work or function or anything. But anyway, she she left in in better spirits, and um, maybe thirty minutes later, yeah, maybe just a few minutes later, yeah, just a few minutes later, her there's another vehicle pulled up. And it was her mom, her sister, and her brother. She went home and she told them, she said, y'all got to, the, this, uh, these people are out there praying for people at Commerce Square. And she said, I just, I, it was just, I mean, they just spoke and, and, and just, and she said, y'all just got to experience that. She, she was telling them about it and they, so they loaded up and they came by and uh, we was able to pray for them. You know. There's been people every time that every they time tell us, I've been person. passing by and passing by, and I finally stopped. Yeah. And so yeah. there's still that one out there. Amen. There's still that one. You know, Jesus Amen. was all about that last one. Amen. He, he, he wanted that last one, and that's what we're after, that last one. That's Amen. Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, so God is moving and things are happening outside of this building. Uh, one other thing, and then I'm going to go ahead and, and, and try to preach this morning, but... Uh, uh, this has been on my, in my heart and mind for, I don't know, a couple months. And I've been real hesitant. I had been very hesitant to do it because I thought, oh, man, just you don't need to do that. That's just, you know. And, and I, I was thinking about doing a, a, like a late night prayer or an online prayer through Zoom or whatever through Facebook and just praying for people. You know, and I thought, nah, you just, you know. That, you know what I mean? I just didn't want to do it because I thought, well, you know, the Bible talks about don't, don't, you know, about the Pharisees that love to be praying publicly and all that. And I thought, yeah. And so I didn't do it for a couple, but I couldn't shake it. Right. I thought, nah, that's the, how many of you, the Spirit of God is trying to get you to do something. You thought, nah, that's just me. Yeah. And, and honestly, I was just thinking, nah, I ain't going to do it. It's just me. And so, and but I couldn't shake it. And I've almost done it probably five, six times, and then now nah, I'm going to do that. Well, the other night, I went ahead, and, and Don and I did it. We did a midnight prayer. How many of y'all are already been down in the sleeping midnight? A lot of you are. Some of you aren't. And I thought, well, we'll just do it. And it was, it was really amazing because we did it, and we just got out in my yard at midnight. I wondered what the neighbor, the neighbors all know. It's they thinking, oh, yeah, they're doing something, you know. But... <laughs> and we begin to pray for people, and we, we and we're gonna, I'm going to try to do that once a week at least. Well, we've done it a couple of times in the last four or five days, but I'm going to try to do it once a week. And what I would like to do, church, is do it through Zoom, and, and that way, if any of you would like to to do it with us and be on, and not just be, you know, because if we do it through Zoom, we can still do it live on Facebook. But you can where you can be in your house or wherever, and we can do it together, and still be visible. And, and the power of agreement is a powerful thing. Amen. Right. Right. So, if you're interested in that, let me know. And it's not hard to do, but but please be praying because we're reaching even people there that we prayed for that would message me back and say, "You, you don't know how much we needed that." Yep. Because at, at, at the base of it, yes, I, one of the things that. I was hesitant because of it's because Jesus said, watch out for the religious people that like to pray publicly all the time, you know, and watch out for those guys. And I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that Pharisee guy. But but then on the flip side of that, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man fails much. Amen. Yeah. And so Wednesday night, I also started the teaching uh, about the prayer life of Jesus, and we were kind of not going necessarily word for word through Brother Glenn's book, but I'm kind of taking that as an outline, and, and what, I've, what I've done, and I'm taking way too long on all this, but what I've done is, is encourage every one of you to, to sanctify and set apart 10 minutes a day yes. of prayer. Yeah. 
that's not very long. We ought to pray an hour. We ought to don't shut up. If you ain't praying at all, and you pray in 10 minutes, that's long. Yeah. That's ten, or you're praying a minute, and then all of a sudden, you, then that's 10 times what you were praying. Amen. Not like, oh, we better keep score. Oh, I only prayed 47 minutes as well. Just, ugh, it wears me out. But, but I'm asking those that will to covenant with the Lord, not with me, but with the Lord. I said, I'm going to give him 10 minutes a day. And I'm going to continue on Wednesday nights to pre record and do a teaching on the prayer life of Jesus, the prayers of Jesus, the prayer life of Jesus, and use that as a base to build up. Amen? And so. Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. And so, this house, yes, but more importantly, this house. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, praise God. Take a breath. Woo! <laughs> SOG, would you pray for me, brother, before I preach this morning? Yeah. Please and thank you. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Amen. Uh, again, as I was attempting to to do a Independence Day message, I was kind of drawing blanks. But for about the last four days, the scriptures that I'm about to read, I got a lot of scriptures to read, and he's just going to roll with it, and I may bounce around, and but but I want to talk to y'all today. But what happens to a person when they truly find liberty? When they truly find uh, independence is kind of a squirrely word because, yeah, we want independence, but how many of you understand? We better be dependent on the Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. And, and so uh, I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about a Bible character named Stephen. And the price that he paid, and the part of the price that this that this uh, individual that we find in the Book of Acts, part of the price that he paid, is part of the price and part of the reason that we're here today. Not all of it, but it is part of it. Amen. It was a building block centuries ago for us. So. That being said, I want to read some scripture and we'll see how far we get. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1, it says, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. <laughs> when the church started growing, people started dropping. Mm, yep. <laughs> when the church started growing, racism was alive and well in the church. The Greeks murmured against the Hebrews. Hebrews are treating them folk better than they treat us. Isn't it funny how, they, listen, this stuff that we deal with every day, it's nothing new. It was happening then. That's not my message, so somebody just look at me and say, move on, Pastor. Move on, All right, because I want to just hammer on that and go forever. And there was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. The twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. They want the preachers to come serve them. How many of you know you? <laughs> if you want that out of me, you're all right. Well, those that did are not here because they figured out I'm not good at it. All right, so, so, but they're going, it's not good that we should tend to all this stuff and leave the word of God. And they're going, that's not what God's called us to do. So, look out upon these seven men of honor and part, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. Before I read any more, what they choose Stephen to do, to wait tables on the widows. 
essentially. They chose Stephen, and, and I don't know what the background things was, but I'm sure some of the apostles said, okay, Stephen, you the man, make sure that you're Make sure that the Greek widows are taken care of just as good as the Jewish widows are. You know, that kind of thing. And that's what this, this was about. But they chose a fellow by the name of Stephen. A man, this defines him. Lord, let this define me. Let this define you. Let this define us. A man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And Philip and Prochorus and this other name I can't pronounce. And this guy, and this guy, and Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. Notice the proper order here. They just didn't decide to do this on their own. Set it before the apostles. And when they had prayed, and laid their, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Go to verse 8 and hold. So there arose a problem in this first century body of believers. Contention, as it were. Racism, as it were. And the leadership was led by God did what they were led to do, appointed these men so that the apostles could stay in the Word of God in the ministry of the Word and not have to be table waiters. And Stephen seems to be the prominent one. What was he appointed to do? To look out after the widows. Yeah. My brain goes to the scripture that says pure religion and undefiled. Come on, it's those that take care of the widows and the orphans. Amen. So, verse 8 says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. This man that they chose... They laid hands on him. They appointed him to do this. But other things were going on as well. It says he was full of faith and power. And he did wonders and miracles among the people. All right? Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, and of them of Sicilia, Sicilia and of Asia disputing with Stephen. The Jewish people there weren't digging it. Mm -hmm. The synagogue was part of that at that time soon to become in the process of becoming the old religious order. In God's eyes it already had but all the people hadn't quite realized it yet. Yeah? They didn't like, now here's this guy whose duty was to minister to the widows equally. As he was doing that, miracles are happening. He's full of faith. He's full of power. Incredible things are happening. Let me just help you out. Man, as you're growing in God and getting full of God and stuff, supernatural things are happening around you, and you're excited, and it's awesome, and this is wonderful, and look what God is doing. Everybody ought to be excited. Yeah, usually they're not. The religious crowd only gets mad when God moves. Yikes. So these people were upset with Stephen because miracles were happening. Because he was ministering to the widows equally and properly. Because signs and wonders were following him. Most of the time they're not mad necessarily because it's happening in them or in him. They mad because it ain't happening in them. They're still trying to do it their way. What'd you say, Frank? Frank, it's enough. We go. You did it your way. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. And rather than humble themselves before God, 
chase after the things of God, but they get mad at the one that God's using. The interpretation of that is they're really mad at God. Yep. They just can't admit it. So they were not able to resist, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. They tried to argue with him. My guess is he wouldn't argue. That's right. Listen, whatever you do, please, ladies and gentlemen, if you're a believer, don't get into a debate or an argument with an unbeliever. Sure, don't do that. But whatever you do with some other religious person that doesn't believe like you're, like, you know, they like to cherry pick scripture and just build their whole thing they believe off of one verse. Just whatever you do, please don't argue with them. Right. Just smile, bless them, walk away. Because you're not going to win an argument. And I don't know that anybody's ever decided to follow Christ because they lost an argument. <laughs> Maybe it's happened. I don't know of it. So, but they couldn't resist. There's, they couldn't. They couldn't resist the wisdom and power that He spoke with. Not because He got angry with them. Not because He. No, it was because the Holy Spirit of God was in Him. Understand? Okay. And I, man, I've got. And, and, He's, I got somebody helping me with the clock this morning because I'll, I'll go. But you know what to do because the clock is off the wall. It was 6:20 a.m. this morning, about 40 minutes ago. Uh, the clock right? What happened here? I like the twilight zone. If we're there, I'm in. But that's just me. Then they suborned men, which said, "We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses." And against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him, caught him and brought him to the council. Don't you just like how people like that are? They're going, did you know? Yeah. Did you know? Did you know? Here's what. Did you know? And, and they're not doing it in front of everybody. They like to go in the parking lot. They like to, they like to, they like to do it when nobody's looking, right. and then they're stirring people up against the things of God. Got them so wound up, they got a hold of Stephen. And in verse 13 says, they set up false witnesses which said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For well, we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Jesus said the one thing that can hinder, the one thing that can make void the word of God is your religious tradition. Right. Amen. 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 Wow. And they're just slamming in here, right? And all that said in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Like they'd never seen an angel before, but you know, something was different. The ones that set in judgment against him saw something naturally, but that was supernatural <coughs> about him. Then said the high priest of these things so. And he said, Men, brethren, fathers, listen up. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharan. And they said to him, Get thee out of your country and from your kindred and come into the land which I shall show you. Now, check this out. This is Stephen. They asked him a question. They said, you being accused of this and this, boy, what you got to say? And I'm sure Stephen was thinking, well, they must want me to preach. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so he went all the way back to Abraham. He said, since you ask, yeah. let me tell you. And he rolls it out, man. 
And then he came to the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Sharan. I don't like that word because I'm not pronouncing it right. And from there, when his father was dead, he removed himself into this land where you live now. And he gave him not inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him for possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spoke like this, that his seed should live and sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. Talking about inches right there. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said the Lord. And after that, they shall come forth and serve me in this place. And gave him the covenant of circumcision. And all the men go, ouch. It's supposed to be funny. Nobody laughed. A few women laughed. None of the men laughed on that, did they? No. I want to. All right. Gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham... But yet Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. Isaac began Jacob, and Jacob began the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, so Jason, Jacob into Egypt, but God was with him. Boy, he's fast forward in this magic. He's going straight from Genesis to the maps. Yeah. He ain't kidding. And delivered him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom inside of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and over all his house. Now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and this other place that I don't like to try to pronounce in great affliction. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard there was corn in Egypt, Hallelujah. He said, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brother, Joseph's kin was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, three score and 15 souls. Jacob went down in Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over in the section and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for some of money of the sons of Nemor, the fathers of Sidon. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Till another king rose, up, or rose which did know Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil and treated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. And, and no, go ahead, go between. At which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nursed up in his father's house three months. Did y'all ever notice that? He was in his father's house three months. He wasn't a newborn baby when Pharaoh's daughter found him. Okay, just something to think about. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nursed him and for her answer. For her own son and Moses was learned, and all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was fully forty years old, it came in his heart to visit his brothers and children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian, which means he killed the dude, all right? If you suppose his brother would have understood how that God was by his hand, how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you're my brothers. Why do you wrong one another? But hold it up 27. I'm reading a lot, but we're getting somewhere. Moses come and, and see when somebody's suffering under oppression, most of the time, they will oppress others. That's right. When somebody's suffering from depression, they'll bring or try to bring depression on others. Now they may or may not mean to, but it's gonna happen. When somebody suffered in slavery, they have a tendency to try to make slaves even of those around them. Isn't that interesting? Everything begets everything after its own kind. So you don't like the way your children act and take a good long look in the mirror. Did I say that? I know I thought it. I'm sorry I said it. No, I'm not. 
having a little bit of a bipolar <laughs> in here, ain't it? Listen, man. Don't forget who we're talking about. Don't forget who's delivering this message. Amen. They just ask him, how do you plead guilty or not? And he's still preaching. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. We're, we're 27 verses down. He, he's just getting started. Let's read on. But he that did his neighbor wrong, thrust him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? You going to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses fled at this day, saying, There was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when 40 years were expired, he ran. Think about this, y'all. He ran and hid in Midian, married Jethro's daughter. What would you like to have a father-in-law named Jethro? <laughs> Just say it. And he hid for 40 years. I want to tell you, and I hope this helps somebody, you can't outrun the call of God on your Amen. life. Amen. You can't outrun him. Yeah. You, you can hide. You can try. Yeah. He's got more time than you do. <laughs> Moses ran because he tried to do it. He, maybe I should have been I don't know. He tried to do it his way. It didn't work. There appeared unto him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai the angel of the Lord in the flame of fire and bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered about the sight, he drew near, and behold, and the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled. And durst not behold. Then the Lord said to him, Take your shoes off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I've seen, I've seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I've heard their groaning, yeah. and have come down to deliver them. And now come, and I'm going to send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? The same that God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out, and after that he showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness 40 years. Go to 37 and hold. This dude is wound up. Take a breath, but don't forget what we're doing here. This is Stephen, who was accused of all this bad stuff. He still, he ain't even took a breath yet. But notice what he's saying. Who's he playing to? He's playing to the Jewish community here. And he's letting them know all of their history. And he's doing it under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't doing it out of self-righteousness or arrogance or out of religious pride. He was doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God. And so this Jewish crowd, so far, they've got to be going, uh-huh, okay, yeah, right about that. That's right, it happened, sure enough, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right now, it looks like he's winning the crowd over, doesn't it? He looks like he's playing to the crowd, doesn't it? Hmm. Let's read the book. Then this Moses would say to the children of Israel, Prophet, shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like me, him you'll hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the living oracles to, the King James says, the lively oracles to give us, to whom our fathers wouldn't obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Hold verse 40. God sent Moses to me. Y'all know the story. It's not my message today and I'm running out of time. The plagues, Pharaoh, frogs, darkness, fleas, blood. All the ten plagues. Every time Pharaoh, he'd tell Pharaoh, 
God said, let my people go. Pharaoh go, okay, if you'll stop, I'll let the people go. And he would stop, and he'd go, nah, I ain't letting them go. Isn't it funny how people, when they feel oppression or that stuff's happening, they'll call, okay, I surrender. But they didn't really surrender. <laughs> right. And finally, y'all know the Passover, firstborn. They're out. Can you imagine being one of, and please hear me, because I'm not, I'm not coming at you, I'm not trying to come at you in arrogance or anything this morning, but I hope some of you can hear. Can, can, can you imagine these slaves? They ain't known nothing but slavery for 400 years. Nobody in their history can remember not being a slave. Mama don't remember, daddy don't remember, grandpa don't remember, great grandpa, life expectancy wasn't really long for a slave, so none of them probably knew their great grandparents, they didn't live that long, but grandpa, do you remember your grandpa saying anything about freedom? No, we've been in, if you've been in slavery for 400 years, it is so ingrained in you that you can't think any other way other than like a slave. If you've been bound by addiction almost all of your life and you get free, man, it's hard to not think like an addict. Right. If you've been an adulterer most of your life and suddenly God begins to get a hold of you, it's hard not to think like an adulterer. Amen. Gossip. Liar. Amen. Oh, y'all liking all that? How about glutton? Don't we look at one another's belly when I say that? <laughs> Stop it. God had to, God had delivered them. They're out. They saw all the mighty works of God and still, but their heart was still entrenched in the Egyptian way. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Egypt will kill you. The world will destroy you. And it does it from the inside out. Yeah. Even though their liberty was in the process of being purchased, they didn't want it. Saying in the era, Make us gods to go before us, for as this Moses, which brought us out of the, the, the land of Egypt, we don't even know what happened to him. Y'all know the story. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice to the idol and rejoiced. Watch out, America. Watch out, y'all. Come on. Watch out. And rejoice at the works of their own hands. You didn't set yourself free. Right. You didn't beat your own addiction. Right. You didn't figure out how to do this Jesus thing. He gave it to you. He delivered it to you. He began to change, as from a, from a New Testament perspective, he began to change you from the inside out. So whatever you do, man, don't ever try to worship the work of your own hands. Don't look with pride at your community. Look what we've done. Hallelujah. Every American sometime. Hallelujah. Careful. 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 And rejoice in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it's written in the book of Proverbs, O ye house of Israel, you have offered me slain beasts and sacrifices for the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yes, and you took up the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of your god, Rephaim, figures which you made to worship them, and I'll carry you away beyond Babylon. 
Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers had. Hey, you know what? He still ain't took a breath. <laughs> Stephen, don't forget what we're doing here. Stephen is still preaching to the Jews. Isn't it funny how he, start, he started in with Abraham and Moses. It's all sounding good. And all of a sudden, there's a slight turn in there. The people began to worship the work of their own hands. And he's looking at those guys, don't you know? And they're going, oh, wait a minute. He's after us. <laughs> yeah. Came in at, and, and, and brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. Boy, fast forward straight to David. Here we go. Who, already? All right. Who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob? But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwells not in the temples made with hands, as says the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my foot to footstool. Which house will you build me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? In other words, he's going, what are you going to do for me? Has it my, has it my hand made all these things? You stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Stephen, being led by the Holy Spirit, just nailed this religious crowd who wanted his blood. That's wrong. Go, go 52. Which of these prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have now been the betrayers and murderers. Man, he turned the tables fast on those guys. Who you, who, excuse me, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Don't you know all those scribes and Pharisees in the crowd that like to count everything and do everything and all the commandments and he's looking at them going, you can't keep the law either. Who do you think you are? When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Now listen, is the Bible truth? Is it more than facts? Is it truth? Look what they did to this boy. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. <laughs> They're taking bites out of him. Face eaters. You face eaters. <laughs> and they didn't even have bath salt yet. <laughs> he got in a little later than they did. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Gnashed on him with a teeth, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, Stephen here, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Back when, and by the time I got saved in the mid 80s, there was a song that was popular on Christian radio. Someone stood up for Stephen yeah. when Stephen stood up for them. He said he saw Jesus not seated at the right hand of God, which is his proper position. But when Jesus looked down and saw his servant, his son, his brother about to be stoned, can you get the full immensity of this? He allowed Stephen to see the heavens open. Stephen saw the Son of God stand up. The very Son of God, who is the creator of the universe. Yes. He saw that very Son of God stand up in honor of one who was about to be slain. Amen. And yet we play patty cake with Jesus most Sundays. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open 
and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. I haven't, I've got to stop here in just a minute. I haven't even got to my message yet. Saul, who would later be known of as Paul. Most say was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Bible doesn't address that, but obviously he has some authority. And he gave the nod for Stephen to die. Mm. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, now hear what Stephen said, Americans. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their children. God had a bigger plan because of that young man Saul, who would later be known as Paul. Don't you know that that day haunted him in his sleep? Don't you know that in the days and months and years after that, that he could not get that out of his mind, how that young man was stoned and what he saw in the anointing that he spoke with and Saul was still the one trying to kill Christians and put them in prison? God used that one thing, and you'll find out later in the book of Acts, and Paul references it later on when he's given his testimony. God used that one thing right there to turn that young man's heart later on. When we first started going back to Mexico, about 2010, when all the white people said, don't go, when the American government said, don't go. When the Mexicans, when we were crossed over, were saying, don't come in here. It's not safe. I crossed one time, me and Josh crossed one time at Falcon Lake right after uh, a bunch of murders had taken place. And if you've ever been on an international crossing there on those highways, there's usually thousands of cars. That afternoon, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we were the only car going into Mexico. <laughs> the American checkpoint were looking at us like, what are y'all doing? Do you know anybody over there? We're going, no, we don't know anybody. We're going to go preach. Yeah. And they're looking at, these boys are stupid. They're going, you, 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 well, all right, go. When we got, we, we crossed the bridge from the American point, we got to the Mexican checkpoint right there as we're coming into Mexico, these guys, they're loaded down with body armor. They got, they got ARs. They're all there. And, and, and they're going, you're doing what? You can't come in here. They're going, yeah, we are. There was one of those guards that afternoon that busted out laughing at me. And he can speak a little English. He's going, white boy, you won't live till sundown. And I know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about Stephen. And I must admit, there was a part of me that was going, I hope I don't. What an honor it would be. See, y'all, you Americans don't think like this. But what an honor it would be. See, we, we can't think like that, can we? But what an honor it would be. But in my redneckish arrogance, I'm going, I tell you what, I bet you 20 bucks. <laughs> Not only will I live, but while I'm there, I'm going to preach. He was he was literally slapping his knee and laughing, going, go to your death then, Anglo. We went over there, and within 30 minutes, we were praying over pastors and preaching. It happened, not because we were anything, but because God let us. But back to my story. I know I'm, I'm, I'm eating, I'm eating y'all's time, but please, please be merciful to me. How many of you give me five more minutes? Hold your hand up and give me five more minutes. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, all give you five. Yeah. Okay, I got plenty of time. I got plenty of time. I haven't done that in a while, so. All the new folks think it's funny. The old folks are just rolling their eyes. No, he does that all the time. All right. Listen up. We first started going to Juarez. 
I want you to hear about a man. His name was Lalo Garcia. He was one of the most prominent pastors in Juarez. He's one of the guys that Josh met. And when, when Josh was, and we were distributing the Psalm 91 books by Peggy Joyce Root, this man had a warehouse. And I, I was in that warehouse later on, and there were pallet after pallet. And there was probably a quarter of a million of those books that we had shipped over there. Lalo Garcia was the pastor that was making it happen. Lalo Garcia was the pastor that believed in his city. Lalo Garcia was the man who believed God. Lalo Garcia was the man whom the cartel had killed about a year before we started going. And he wouldn't back down, and he wasn't arrogant. And he wasn't haughty and prideful, yet he pastored one of the biggest churches in that, in that city. A man full of faith. A man who was instrumental in opening the doors for us in Mexico when we first got started. Opening the door, Josh built a good relationship with him. Preached in his church. I think I preached in his church. I preached in so many, I don't remember. I know I preached with him in the crowd. Thinking, how dare I say a word when we got men of God like this? His son was kidnapped and murdered by the cartel in about 2010. His daughter was kidnapped, and he had he wound up having to pay a ransom because the government wouldn't do anything. Wound up getting her back finally. Thank God. And when you talk, when you were in the presence of this particular man. You knew you were in the presence of greatness. Because God was doing a work there. And within a few months, that city became known, it was known of as the most dangerous city in the world at that time. Within a few months of distributing those Psalm 91 books, and within a few months of Josh going back over and over and over, and us going back over and over and over, crime began to decline. Murders began to decline in that city. The secular media couldn't figure it out. This was in 2011. The secular media couldn't figure it out. They wrote articles going, we don't understand what crime rate's going down. We knew why. Because we were praying and because we were letting the body of Christ know, you've been made free. Greater is he that's within you than he that's in this world. Well, the Americans play pancake with Jesus faithfully every Sunday. My understanding, and I may have these facts a little off, I'm not sure, but this is what I've been told and led to believe, is that when they assassinated Lalo Garcia's son, how many of you remember watching The Godfather? The character Sonny and the Godfather, the way he was assassinated on that bridge, that they tried to kind of reenact that. And they killed his son. And I remember standing in a church one night before I was to preach and him showing a video that they had made praying for their city, praying for their nation. Staying faithful. And in 2018, the drug cartel in that area did the same thing to Lalo Garcia that they had done to his son about 10 years or nine years earlier. And they assassinated him. I wonder, I don't know. But I wonder if Lalo Garcia looked up to heaven, saw the Son of God speak. Ladies and gentlemen, don't take your liberty in Christ for granted. Don't take your liberty as an American for granted. I want to encourage you. I don't, I don't know if this sounds arrogant or 
self-serving or self-righteous. I hope it doesn't. But please stop playing patty cake with Jesus. Dig in. And get a hold of Him. Christ. Your freedom wasn't free. Your freedom as an American wasn't free. It cost great men and women their very life. Your freedom in Christ wasn't free. It cost Jesus everything. But I also want to say there are many men like Stephen. There are many men like the men that I knew named Lalo Garcia. There are many men around our planet today that are paying the ultimate price. What are you doing with your liberty? Lord, may you have mercy on us all. Lord, let us be a reflection of you. Not ourselves, not our church denominations, not, not our religious thought. But let us be a reflection, Lord, of you. Let us remember what it cost Stephen. And out of that death of Stephen, the beginning stages of who we now know as the Apostle Paul were started. Thank you, Father. That was you. And all oh, that one of us, all oh, that any of us can have the honor of paying that kind of price. Grant it, Lord. Let us never take for granted the liberty that you've given us. Let us never forget the men like Steve and more recently the men like Lalo Garcia. And you know, thousands if not hundreds of thousands of others around this world that pay in blood every day for Christ.
Hallelujah.